Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching the Eggnog Riot, Christmas Chaos at West Point by Extra History. I'll start this one off by saying Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. I'm not recording this video on Christmas, of course, but I will be uploading it on Christmas. So I hope you guys are all having a good day today. I hope you're spending some time with your family, eating some good food, feeling that Christmas cheer. That's certainly what I will be doing on Christmas Day. Uh, I saw Extra History release this video. I thought it was perfect for today, of course. Uh, I don't know anything about the Eggnog Riot. Uh, I see based on the title that it's about West Point, so we're talking about American history. So maybe I can add a thing or two here or there. But, you know, I don't think I know anything about it, so I'm excited to learn. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships, through which you can see exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. U.S. Military Academy, West Point, New York, 1826. Ah, uh, okay, 1826. I'm already getting some context from that date. So we're talking about West Point, 1826. That means probably those who graduate from West Point at this time will go on to fight in the Mexican-American War and the Civil War. So, maybe we will see some recognizable faces. Twas the night before Christmas, about <laughs> second watch, when cadets were preparing for a festive debauch. They stirred up some yolks, cream, and cinnamon roots, and produced hidden booze from footlockers <laughs> and boots. They whipped at the mixture to thicken the nog, then tipped in three gallons of moonshine and grog. They hey. toasted the season while keeping things quiet. And 11 toasts later... Mm. Ooh. came the great eggnog riot yeah 11 toasts later i could see how that might cause some ruckus at a military academy i'm curious to see how bad this riot gets <laughs> thanks so much to tab for a cause for supporting great charities find out how you can help for free after the episode mm. eggnog a beloved holiday beverage Creamy and sweet, kind of huh. like a knit sweater in drink form, you know? Essentially harmless. Unless you were drinking it in well, 1970. Yeah, as essentially harmless as any other alcoholic beverage is. Century America, when it would get you totally trashed. Back then, Eggnog incorporated all that was cheap and plentiful in the early American Republic. Eggs ah. and milk from dairy farms, sugar from the Caribbean triangle trade, and who could forget, huge amounts of alcohol. Yeah, well, sugar was pretty plentiful. As they mentioned, the triangle trade, there were a lot of plantations, slave plantations, on the Caribbean islands that produced a massive amount of sugar, uh, a lot of which was sent back to Europe, but considering the proximity to the young United States, a lot of that sugar was also sent to the U.S. So yeah, I imagine sugar would be pretty plentiful. There was also a lot of whiskey and rum distilled in the Caribbean and throughout the U.S., so, I can see why these ingredients would be plentiful. George Washington went hard with his own recipe, calling for a pint of brandy, a half pint of rum, a half pint of rye whiskey, and a quarter pint of wow. sherry. Wow. Uh, but with this mixture, he led his guests in giving toast after toast after toast after toast, draining the glass each time. <laughs> yeah, turned out getting blitzed at the holidays was kind of an American custom, which is why in 1826, dozens of West Point cadets defied the orders of Superintendent Sylvanus Thayer and brewed up a batch of boozy eggnog on their own. Oh. Now, Thayer ran West Point on a strict disciplinary regime. Actually, he'd been brought in for that purpose, appointed in 1817 to reform... Well, when was West Point founded? Because obviously, we are pretty early in America's history. Um, you know, we're still talking about the relatively early days of the Republic. So I'm curious as to when West Point was founded. Was West Point an institution that existed prior to the existence of the Republic? Or was it created soon afterwards? I'm sure someone can answer that down below. The then failing institution. He introduced a regimented schedule, physical exercise, a new focus on engineering, a four-year curriculum, and a series of ah, demerits. A focus on engineering. Now, that is extremely important. Uh, I mean, engineering is very important to the military, but particularly when we're talking about this era, throughout the 1800s, engineering will be extremely important. And it's also a pretty prestigious position to be in, you know, part of the engineer corps, a leadership position. So that, that's key, I would say. 
basically anything you imagine when you hear the words West Point. And that also included yeah. a strict code of conduct, which forbid cadets from purchasing, possessing, and drinking alcohol. At first, Thayer made exceptions for holidays. Okay. I felt it was probably a good idea to check West Point established, at least according to Wikipedia, 1802. So, at this point, it's only been around for about 20 years, and it was established pretty soon after the founding of the Republic. Cadets could drink on the 4th of July and Christmas. But mm. Independence Day 1825 had turned into a drunken <laughs> embarrassment, with cadets performing a snake dance and carrying Major William Worth, <laughs> the popular commandant of cadets, back to the oh barracks, my. an unacceptable loss of military bearing. So now, Thayer had banned alcohol totally, and for the Christmas of 1826, the eggnog would be served bone dry. Yet Thayer still worried that someone, somewhere, was having a good time. That's why, at his personal Christmas party on December 23rd, 1826, Thayer pulls Major Worth aside into a quiet corner to discuss rumors he's heard that cadets are smuggling in alcohol. And he even has a chief suspect, Cadet Jefferson Davis. <laughs> yup, that Jefferson Davis. Ah, well, they put it on screen. Yeah, future president of the Confederacy. As I said... <laughs> Looking at that date they gave at the beginning, I expected to see some people involved in the Mexican-American War and the Civil War. And, of course, we have someone very involved in the Civil War. Uh, that's interesting. I'm curious to see who else pops up. As in later president of the Confederacy, yep. Jefferson Davis. Turns out Davis is the worst drunk at the school, notorious <laughs> for sneaking out to taverns. In well, that's good qualifications for being the president of the Confederacy, huh? In fact, he'd just gotten out of the hospital after an incident where he'd been stumbling back in the dark and fallen down a 60-foot ravine. Needless God damn, a 60-foot ravine! Okay, so this man is getting blind drunk. To say, Davis was a bad influence. A rebel. Though not like that teacher's pet, Robert E. Lee, of course, who showed ah. up at Thayer's office at 7 a.m. that morning to discuss trigonometry homework. Interesting. I feel like that fits with Robert E. Lee's character. Um, you know, teacher's pet, very studious. Um, that fits with other things I've heard about Robert E. Lee. Regardless, Thayer tells Worth that instructors staying in the barracks, Captain Hitchcock and Lieutenant Thornton, should mm. definitely keep on the lookout. And boy, was he right to be concerned. For even as Thayer spoke, a batch of contraband eggnog was already brewing in the North Barracks. For weeks, cadets had been felching ingredients and food from the mess hall. And sure enough, Jefferson Davis was one of the instigators. <laughs> the most intrepid of which had ventured out to barter for alcohol at nearby taverns, but finding the prices too expensive for the sheer quantity they needed. Four cadets had crossed the Hudson River, where prices were cheaper. Mm. They finally settled on two gallons of cheap, barely aged moonshine whiskey. Oh man, okay, so they're getting some strong stuff. I can already kind of see how this is going to get out of hand. But they ran into trouble on the way back, when they found a U.S. Army private guarding the West Point dock. Uh -oh. So, whispering amongst themselves, they made a plan, scrapping together all of the money they had left for a bribe. 35 cents, which worked. Man, Zoe, corruption used to be so affordable. <sighs> Freaking inflation. <laughs> so back at the barracks, they poured the... Ah, uh, what inflation has done to us. Corruption is so expensive these days. Whiskey into the mix, along with a gallon of rum from another cadet. This was their act of resistance. A <laughs> statement proving that they couldn't take away their boozy, deeply unhealthy traditions. Yeah. Oh, yes. Tomorrow they would toast and get toasted. Christmas Eve, the North Barracks... 11.59 p.m. <laughs> All is quiet when Captain Hitchcock makes his final night patrol. Hmm. Seems like Thayer's worries were unfounded. Whatever's happening, at least it's staying quiet. He and Thornton go to bed. But in room 28, the holiday nog bar is open, baby! Oh, yeah. They're stealthing in to get their drink, then spilling into the nearby room to toast. But the party has been going on for hours. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to stay sneaky for long. Having a sneaky, boozy celebration is all great until everybody gets really drunk and then nobody's going to be quiet anymore. <laughs> and the mix is getting a little thin. That is until a Christmas miracle when a cadet returns from a midnight run with another gallon of whiskey. Oh, <laughs> hey, man. wait, did I say miracle? I, uh, I meant catastrophe <laughs> because this is where things start to go downhill. 
At 4 a.m. Christmas morning, Hitchcock awakes to such a clatter that he sprang from his bed to see what was the matter, which was, of course, two floors above him, a ton of singing, stomping, and shouting, you know, just full-on revelry. Yeah, he of course. He crashes the party and finds six cadets in a single room, and he's halfway through ordering them all back to their beds when he hears another commotion next door. And what Hitchcock finds in that room is both pathetic and hilarious. Three cadets completely blitzed, two cower <laughs> under a blanket, while another tries to, and I kid you not, hide his identity by putting <laughs> a hat over his face, which works exactly as well as you'd expect it would. Oh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> Just seeing, you know, these cadets at West Point, these are supposed to be some of the best of the best. And, I mean, they are some of the best of the best. But, you know, when everybody gets absolutely sloshed, all those qualifications go out the window, and you've got a bunch of idiots stomping around and getting themselves into trouble. What? Hitchcock berates them, ordering them back to their rooms. <laughs> but the mood among the cadets starts to turn here a little. They're uh -oh. not cowed, they're angry. I mean, how- Oh, uh, we've got some angry drunks. Um, you know, people can do several things when they're drunk. Um, some people get all, you know, lovey-dovey. Um, some people get angry. You don't want to be an angry drunk. I mean, if you can't control it, you can't control it. But, you know, it's not great. It kind of get, gets you into trouble sometimes. And I think we're about to see that with these fellas. How dare he try to stop their deep-seated and wholesome tradition of celebrating the Messiah's birth by getting utterly annihilated <laughs> on cream drinks laced with cheap rot. Huh? <laughs> and just as things start heating up, Hitchcock hears another roar downstairs and heads for the stairwell. Upon his exit, a cadet then makes a drunken decree. Get your dirks and bayonets and pistols if you got them. Before the night's over, Hitchcock will be dead. Oh no. Meanwhile, on the ground floor, Hitchcock... I hope that doesn't come true. Hitchcock bursts into room five, and it's crammed with cadets, more than the upstairs party. They all go still and turn... I guess it gets a little dangerous when you got a bunch of drunk dudes with military training and weaponry at hand. Now, I, you know, of course Mercer's like a buzzkill, but you don't actually want anything to happen to him. I mean, the worst things should get in a situation like this is maybe like a drunken brawl. That's already bad enough. You know, I hope that nobody actually gets seriously wounded or, or worse, murdered. Turn to him. Then, with just the most impeccable timing, the opposite door slams open, and Jefferson Davis <laughs> staggers in completely sh faced and shouts, You should put away the grog, boys! Captain Hitchcock is coming! He then presumably- Future president of the Confederacy here. <laughs> he adds a, oh Hitchcock reads the cadets the riot act, legally informing them they must disperse. He oh. then specifically orders Davis to go back to his room and stay there. Davis does and passes out in bed, thereby missing ah. the rest of... Well, honestly, that's probably what's best for him. Um, we still have uh, about half of this video left, and I'm guessing it's probably best for Jefferson Davis that he was not involved in whatever riot is about to occur. The festivities as the building descends into chaos. Dozens of drunk, belligerent cadets seize weapons. Uh -oh. Then, when Hitchcock comes across a locked room, he kicks down the door only to find himself Whoa. looking down the barrel of a pistol. Whoa. The powder jets in his face, but another cadet has slammed into the first cadet holding the gun, knocking off his aim. Okay, jeez, man. Yeah, good for that guy. Uh, we have either someone who's not as drunk as the rest, or someone who can hold his liquor a little bit better and is thinking more clearly. This is starting to get seriously out of hand. The bullet then explodes in the doorframe next to Hitchcock's head. Lieutenant Thornton, now awake, was doing no better. He tried to gain control of one group, only to be menaced with a sword. And then when he turned down a stairwell, another cadet knocked him out cold oh, with Jesus. a piece of wood. Hitchcock ran to a cadet on guard duty and told him to get the Commandant Major Worth. He was popular with the cadets and they might listen to him. Mm. Only here's where things get really twisted. Because uh -oh. some of the rioting cadets misheard what Hitchcock said and thought that he'd called for regular artillery soldiers that were stationed at West Point. Oh no. I mean, this makes sense how it's spiraling out of control, but this is not good. You know, the fellows in charge are just trying to control the situation. You know, go and get someone who's popular with the cadets. Maybe he can calm them down. Of course, these drunken buffoons interpret that as, oh my god, we're under attack. We have to resist. I don't know what they're going to do now, but it's probably not going to be good. 
The generally upper-class cadets hated those lowly rank-and-file soldiers. And now what, Hitchcock wanted them to come and shell the barracks or something? Just no, absolutely not. No. Mm. Interesting, there's a bit of a class dimension there. Though I suppose that does make sense. West Point, the best of the best, generally, particularly at this time, would translate to some of the most elite. Um, if we're talking about, you know, some of those who would go on to be Confederates, we're talking about a lot of men, boys, who came from the planter elite of the South. Uh, and, of course, those who came from the North also came from the elite families of whichever respective region they're from. So, yeah, that's sort of an interesting element. No! The sloshed youths broke out their weapons in full and started fortifying the building. They Jesus. besieged Hitchcock in his room, throwing stones and pieces of wood at his windows. And they broke everything. They tore banisters off the stairs, shattered windows, and smashed all of the cookery. By the time Major Worth arrived just before 6 a.m., the eggnog was beginning mm. to wear off. And when he called... Okay, well, it seems like nobody was seriously injured. Things are calming down. I mean, look, it's not great to get super drunk. Uh, attempt <laughs> to seriously injure your superiors and then trash the barracks. But that is better than actually killing or seriously injuring someone. Called for morning formation, the mutineers actually staggered out uh, sheepish and ill, making wow. a ragged line under the cruel Christmas dawn. Jesus. 90 cadets, one third of the student body, took part in the eggnog riot. But, since expelling a third of the school would have been a major embarrassment, <laughs> they decided to only court-martial the 20 worst offenders. Okay, so, they're trying to protect their reputation a bit, which makes sense. I mean, they mentioned the beginning of this video how there have been some reforms a couple years back. The, you know, West Point had gotten back on its feet. It was doing better. It would be extremely embarrassing to expel a third of your student body. Since he'd gone to bed, Jefferson Davis escaped charges and was instead confined to barracks for six weeks, meaning hmm. that despite helping instigate the party, he largely dodged consequences. And yeah. I mean, look, I never want to give it to Jefferson Davis. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not a great guy. But he certainly was an instigator. So maybe he should have been one of the main people punished. But he did go to bed and uninvolve himself when things started getting really bad. I mean, not like he made an intelligent decision on his own. He was told to go to bed, and I'm sure he stumbled to bed drunk and passed out. So, I don't know. He was one of the instigators, but he didn't contribute to the worst parts of this event. It's kind of up in the air. Mixed bag for me. And Robert E. Lee, who had not participated, testified on behalf of the accused cadets, using mm. his reputation as an honorable gentleman to launder his comrades' actions. <laughs> this would, to put it lightly, become a reoccurring theme in both of their lives. <laughs> Ultimately, nine cadet Very true. were permanently expelled. Their careers ruined so badly that two of them later became Confederate generals and won the <laughs> Texas Secretary of State. Hugh W. Mercer, that's a general that I'm familiar with. By the way... Uh, his grandfather, also Hugh Mercer, uh, I know this because I am Scottish and he was Scottish, served in the Revolutionary War and also served in the Jacobite Rebellion back in Scotland. Uh, he fought at Culloden, which I've actually visited. So, interesting little fact about uh, the Mercer family. Though another disgraced candidate spent most of his life entangled with the legal system, eventually serving eight years as a justice on the Supreme Court. <laughs> oh, man, Zoe, for a second, I was worried someone was going to learn something and there was going to be accountability. But okay, so we're talking about a bunch of men who got in trouble for this, who then went on to serve in pretty damn prominent positions in military and government. But thank you so much for keeping the status quo. USA! USA! <laughs> mm, hold on. Mm, this is strong. <clears throat> Actually, though, perhaps one thing was learned. Because these days, things happen a little bit different at West Point, as they send their cadets home for the holidays. So, if they happen to, say, get drunk and smash all the dishes, you know what? At least it's at their own family's house. Yeah. Wow, Rob. Seems better that way. Oh, that was a phenomenal story. Thank you for penning the script. David, thank you so much for illustrating this episode. Also, thank you so much to... Um... <laughs> we got a bit of a drunken ramble going on, but... In the spirit of Christmas, I'll let it go. Our audio editor and the boys over at Devon House Creative who put together the edit. Uh, and you know, Shout out to the editors and the artists and the voice actor. You know, everybody who worked on 
these uh, this video and these fantastic videos in general. Like, this, this brings me to a larger point. Uh, I've been drinking eggnog the entire time I've been reading the script, <laughs> and uh, it has gotten me a little emotional. It is the holidays after all, and I'm the show uh -huh, and I can uh -huh. do what I want. So, uh, I would like to propose a toast. I would like to cheers to everyone who works with us uh, at Extra Credits. You are all wonderful beans, and these shows are ultimately amazing because of you all. Uh, I would also like to thank all of the viewers who have been hey. watching with us either this year or, That's us. or over the years. Um, your, your support and, uh, I don't know, the kind words and just <laughs> being overall wonderful beans means the absolute world to me, and I know it means the absolute world to the Extra Credits crew. So please uh, raise a glass of Nog, alcoholic or not, well, in the air. And I'll raise my water. To a happy, wonderful, and joyous holiday season Cheers. to you all. I wish you all the best. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. And actually, in the spirit of said holidays. All right. Um, there we go. That was a good video. Uh, shout out to all the viewers. Shout out to all my viewers. Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, shout out to Extra History for making these fantastic videos. Uh, I hope everybody is having a great holiday season, a great Christmas if you celebrate Christmas. Um, today, of course, when this video is being released is Christmas, so I hope you're having a great day. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching this video, for watching all the videos. Uh, if you enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, a comment, subscribe. Check out the Patreon and channel memberships for exclusive content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you're all having a fantastic day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.